Good afternoon, and welcome to Between the Pillars, the Fisher Library's video podcast series. My name is John Shoesmith, and I'm the Outreach Librarian here at the Fisher, and we're beginning our second season of, uh, of this podcast series. And the good news, as you can see, uh, both myself and my colleague, PJ Careford, who we'll be uh, chatting with very shortly, um, we're both inside the library. So unlike last year, when uh, the majority of the series was done remotely, we are um, physically back in the library. But however, we're still following health and safety protocols. So, so even though myself and PJ are at the library, um, out of uh, adherence to social distancing, we're actually in separate rooms. I'm in the main reading room. Uh, PJ is in our East reading room. So this way we can remove our masks for one and, uh, and do this safely. So it's, it's today is October 15th, Friday, October 15th. And just a qu couple of quick words about uh, the Fisher and where we stand with respect to our, um, to our service offerings. Uh, we continue to be closed. Um, largely because our front, our main front door is being replaced. So um, we hope that doesn't last too much longer and that we'll be able to open to researchers um, very shortly. So I would suggest please just follow our website, um, our social media channels, and we'll have information about our reopening um, when, we, when we have it ourselves. Uh, we are still available for uh, reference services, for virtual reference. Uh, just email us um, with scanning requests and we will try to get to them as best we can. However, Between the Pillars is back, um, and so we'll be with you every second week through the academic year and hopefully right up to the summer. Um, so please join us throughout and where you get to meet the uh, different Fisher staff. We hope to have a couple of special guests. Um, we'll get to meet some, um, get to meet some interesting people, get to, uh, get to see some interesting things. And, uh, and of course, all the episodes are up on our uh, YouTube site. So this season and also last season. So with that, I want you to introduce my long-standing colleague, uh, PJ Carefoot. Um, as I mentioned to PJ actually the other day, he's actually the longest standing colleague I've ever had in my professional career. So awesome. going back 16 years. I'm honored. Uh, it's, it's, and it's, it's, it's interesting too, because um, PJ, who is, you know, he's been, he, I've worked with him 16 years. This um, will be the last year I work with PJ, unfortunately, since he is going to be retiring very shortly. And so we thought we'd begin the season off by um, both uh, feting PJ in one way, in terms of um, looking back on his career here at Fisher, and also showing what we're calling the segment uh, PJ's favorite things. So we're going back in time to when he first started out at Fisher, um, through to him becoming head of the department, and uh, showing some of uh, some of what we're calling PJ's treasures. So PJ, welcome. Uh, thank, you thank you for much. thank you for joining us. You're a second time uh, participant on uh, Between the Pillars. You were on one of our one of my parents' favorite uh, podcasts, actually talking about Christmas things, uh, your, your Christmas materials. So um, this is a little bit different, but we are going to be showing some some of your favorite things. And but before we start showing some of the things, I want to kind of talk a little bit about your. Uh, your career here at Fisher, and even going back to when prior to you working at at Fisher, when you went back to um, you, in the last podcast, we kind of talked about your varied career, and then you going back to uh, graduate school to study at uh, then the Faculty of Information Studies. Um, what was the reasoning behind that? Did you just sort of had an interest in libraries, or you were looking for another career change, or? Well, at the at the time that uh, I initially went to the. Uh as we called it then, the Faculty of uh, Information Studies. Um, it was back in 1994, actually. And uh, I was changing careers, as, as you mentioned. And I went there uh, largely because, of course, I had been working uh, a lot in the previous four years in academic libraries as I was working on my graduate degree um, in, in theology over in Belgium. And so when I decided that it was time for change, it was actually one of my friends who was the school librarian in my high school who said, have you ever thought about uh, going to uh, the library school, as he called it. Right. Um, so that was the that was sort of planted the seed in my head that there, there, there was an alternative to what I was doing that, that somehow, in a way, was a continuation of what I was doing. And uh, um, I, I, I didn't have it in my head at the time that I would end up at uh, the Fisher. Um, uh, it was it was just the idea that uh, academic librarianship was something that I was I was very interested in. Um, it was only in my last year of uh, studies that uh, I ended up, as I think I mentioned before, in Richard Landon's, like many of us, in Richard Landon's rare book class, and uh, he suggested thinking of of applying to the Fisher, and uh, which I did, and thank heaven I did, because it ended up being the most incredible job uh, of, of, of my life for the last 20 years has been absolutely remarkable uh, 
Uh, See, it's interesting to me because when I, I mean, I, like you, have changed careers um, a few times. And when I went back to uh, what I was I also call library school, it was with the intent of working at a place like the Fisher. Was that in your sort of thought process at all? or I knew that I wanted to be in, in an academic library. I wasn't sure what exactly that was going to look like. But I once I was in Richard's class, I really did think, wow, the special collections are in, incredible. And, and they stimulated me so much, especially as I saw that there were so many different angles within special collections that um, provided meaningful work, at least to, to someone who's interested in, in, as I am, in history and the development of human thought. So it, um, it, it hadn't initially been there until I was in Richard's class. So once again, as with many of us, uh, Richard made a, a, a huge difference in terms of my future. Tell us then about your first few days, few weeks at Fisher. I mean, it's 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 not necessarily an intimidating place to work, but it's a place where people stay, have been here for a long time. Um, there's a lot of sort of collective intelligence and to step into that. I know when I first stepped into that, it could be a little bit intimidating. Maybe t- tell us about your kind of first. Well, it absolutely was. So the, the, the day that I arrived, uh, the, the day previous to that, uh, was the last day for three of, of the uh, library staff who had been here for 30, 40 years. So okay. they walked out the door and in came this newbie like me who you know didn't really know anything about the, about the Fisher. Uh, and except, it, 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 well, it was a very welcoming place. From the very beginning, the librarians who were here made me feel welcome. Um, they made me feel that I had a contribution to make and they, and they fostered that. Uh, when I heard the other thing that was intimidating here, uh, seeing as we're living through it right now, um, when I arrived, we were just beginning to introduce Circe, which was the old mm. cataloging uh, module that we've worked with uh, for the last 20 years almost. And uh, so that was that was a whole new thing. We were all learning at the same time. And that in a way was, was a good thing. It, it's kind of level at least one of the playing fields. But um, you realize that the incredible expertise of the librarians who had been working here was, uh, um, it was, it was amazing. And as you say, the collective memory of the people who were here um, was also a, a, an amazing thing. They were, they, it, was, it was a great, great company of people to work with. How did you learn rare book cataloging? I mean, we often, we often say that we're always learning rare book cataloging. It's, it's a skill that really continues to grow over time. Um, did, did you have anyone, any librarians in particular that taught you? I, I did. The two that uh, took responsibility for me really were uh, Philip Oldfield and Lula Fristacki. Mm-hmm. And the two of them together uh, over, you know, actually in those, in those days at the beginning, it was about two years that you were under the tutelage of, of one of the senior librarians before they kind of let you go your own way. And they were, they were um, uh, very stringent in the application of the rules and making sure that, uh, you know, the little slips that were there, mm-hmm. get rid of the little slips uh, as, as best as you possibly could. I mean, we all know that errors continue to happen, but you did become aware of the fact that detail mattered. Mm. And they were the ones that were checking up on it and saying, oh, you missed this, you missed that, this is good, um, build on this. And between the two of them, as I say, it took about a year and a half to two years before they finally said, okay, you're, you're on your own now. Um, but it was, it was an amazing experience uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, you know, working, on these, working on these incredible, incredible volumes. So one of the things we wanted to show was one of the first things you cataloged here at Fisher. So why don't we switch on the document camera and, uh, and, uh, and look at some of the materials. And uh, yes, yeah, so the very first, the very first, I'm going to show you right now, the very first book that I cataloged. And it is, I'm just going to go out a bit. This is the very first book that, uh, that I cataloged. And uh, this is Aesop's Fables illustrated by Wenceslas Haller. So the very first collection that I worked on was the Haller collection. And uh, for those who may not know it, um, the Fisher has the second or third, depending on who you ask, largest collection of Haller in the world. The Queen has the largest, then it's a, a, we we duke it out between us and uh, Prague as to who has the largest collection after that. Um, But it's, it's an amazing collection of this man, Wenceslas Haller, who was an engraver etcher really in the, um, he worked in the 17th and early 18th centuries. An amazing career. Um, He spent most of it in London, in England, and uh, he worked there before the English uh, Civil War, during the English Civil War, and after the English Civil War. Um, so it, when you see his illustrations, his, his etchings, 
Uh, they document everything from uh, London that no longer exists you know, because of the, the Great Fire, uh, costumes, mythological characters, historical characters, animals, uh, you, you name it. He, he, he did the most amazing uh, uh, works. One of the things that I most appreciated about working with the Hollywood collection from the very beginning, and this is where my education, as I say, was, was, was really beginning in, in, in this area, was appreciating um, the role of illustrations in books. Up until that time, um, as far as I was concerned, uh, an illustration was an illustration was an illustration. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I came to realize by studying, as, as we do here, looking at the techniques that, of illustration, that the very fact of creating an engraved plate is in itself a work of science and a work of art. And the way that that gets uh, carved, the way that that gets inked, the way that that gets pressed, will mean that no two images are exactly the same. And so when, you know, I, when I would later on, you know, hear people say, oh, you know, I just got a print. And you, you, it was all I could do to say, no, you didn't just get a print in the shop. This is what you got. And, and then start into this, uh, you know, rant about it. And uh, people would look at you sort of thinking, you know, you really have become a little bit bizarre uh, working on on, on all this. But it's, uh, uh, as you can see here, this is one of Haller's incredible etchings, um, uh, accompanying the husband, husbandman and the wood. Um, but it, they're, they're just remarkable. This, uh, here's another one of his, this, this great uh, uh, griffin kind of dragon, uh, the, fi the file and the viper. Um, it, it, as I say, it, it was not only an introduction to rare books, it was an introduction into illustration. And for that, I will always be thankful. Even when I leave here, from now on, I will always be looking at a plate and seeing how it is impressed on the paper and how fine is the design and how fine is the execution. Um, that's the level of detail that we, in, in rare books and special collections, expect of, of our librarians. Do you remember in terms of, if, I mean, if, if it wasn't for one of the first things you cataloged, do you remember how long it actually took you to catalog this one book? Well, at the very beginning, I, I, you know, I, and Philip and Luba used to say, there is, do not worry about rushing to get these things done. It was more important to be accurate. So at the very beginning, a book like this, by the time, you know, we did what we call the collation, which is counting every page, making sure that the, uh, that the, the, the paging is correct, making sure that you've done what we call the, the, the signatures. I'm not sure if you can see there's the, the mm -hmm. one of the signatures here. These are all things that uh, were, were, you'd have to do, which would mean that a book like this could easily take you half to three quarters of a day at the very beginning. Uh, you got better with time. Mm -hmm. But um, when, when you'd be working on medieval manuscripts, for example, which was the other area that I worked in uh, as well, it was nothing to work on a medieval manuscript for a day, two days, three days, uh, because of the unique uh, quality of that kind of a book, which is not um, done in multiples. It's a one-off. It's, it's, uh, uh, it requires a lot more attention. So yeah, it, it, it could easily, on a, on a book of the 17th century like this, easily at the beginning, half a day, three quarters of a day to get through one book. Since you're talking about medieval manuscripts, why don't we show one of your favorite items as well? Because I think you brought, Absolutely. You Absolutely. brought a, a, a treasure of, at the Fisher. Absolutely. So um, here you have this, which is known as the Codex Torontonensis. It's a little dark against the uh, thing, but uh, when we open it, we can see how incredibly beautiful this, this book is. Um, it's dates from, well, we're not 100% sure, but probably around the year 1050. Okay. I'll, I'll see if I can go in a little bit so we can get a little bit closer to yep, it. That's good. Dates from about the year 1050 and was done in Constantinople. Uh, it's not the oldest manuscript we have. Our, our Hebraica collection is actually uh, has older, um, older materials in it, again, scriptural. Um, but why this is one of my favorites. This is for a number of reasons. It was, this was the first copy of the Greek scriptures um, that we know uh, in, in manuscript form that was brought to Canada. It was brought here by Henry Scadding, um, who was uh, long associated with the University of Toronto and its libraries and whose bequest in many ways, I think arguably uh, it marks the beginning of special collections at the university because he did donate to us um, uh, several medieval manuscripts. Uh, he, uh, he was an immigrant as, as a very young boy from England uh, in the uh, 1820s. He's the very first boy who was ever registered at Upper Canada College in their register. Um, 
but I think it, what, what scatting did was he communicated this idea that just because we were a colony, it didn't mean we had to be a backwater. And so he worked hard at, at collecting books that eventually, as I say, after his death in 1901, uh, were bequeathed to the, uh, to the university library system. This particular book, why I love it, um, among other reasons, it, it is done in that period just before the first crusade in Constantinople at a time when Christians and uh, Muslims were living together in relative peace. They were learning from one another. And as a result, this particular book uh, displays a lot of Islamic characteristics to it, despite the fact that it is quite clearly a Christian book. It is the four gospels, um, together with some of the liturgical uh, um, books of the Orthodox Church at, at the back. Um, but if you look, for example, at that illustration, uh, it's the only illustration in the in the book that um, has depicts a, a, a an actual uh, figure uh, here, of course, the head of Christ. But if you look around that, the frame around it is very much a Turkish uh, a carpet. Um, and in fact, if I can, I'm going to see if I can open it to uh, one of the other books of the Bible. Here we're in the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, and you can see. It is a Turkish carpet. Mm -hmm. um, it, it displays a lot of Syrian influence. Um, and it, the, the design is, uh, as you can see, is geometric. There's botanicals. Um, it, 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 it clearly, this could as easily be an Islamic book in some ways in terms of its uh, presentation as it is a Christian one. So uh, to me, I just, I, I, I love it for any number of reasons, not the least of which is that it does mark this time when uh, there was before this, this rancor that erupts after, after the First Crusade, when, when Christians and, and Muslims did live together. And, you know, I, I kind of like to think of it as a, a little bit of hope that, uh, you know, we can eventually get back to uh, those days again as well uh, for, for the peace of the world, if not anything else. Um, but a beautiful, beautiful hand on vellum, of course, uh, which is animal skin, for those who don't know that. Um, a beautiful, beautiful book. This is something you've probably used a lot in your teaching. And maybe you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, prior to even teaching the core rare books course at the iSchool. I mean, you obviously, we all of us do seminars and classes. I mean, this is something obviously you would use quite often. And, and maybe talk about kind of the reaction you get from students when you're showing material like this. Absolutely. So yes, I, I, would, I would do a session, say, for example, on um, medieval manuscripts, just on medieval manuscripts, or sessions uh, for a trial school of theology on the, the history of the book in the Middle Ages or the history of the book in the Reformation. And so book, uh, volumes like this I would use on a regular basis, in, especially when trying to teach students about getting back to the uh, original sources, how important it is to go back to primary sources in, in doing research and, and writing. The reaction from students um, I found almost consistently, especially if, say in the last, well, the last 15 to 20 years, as um, our students become more and more virtual in terms of, of how they read their, the, 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 the digital um, in many ways supplanting in their, in their normal lives um, the, the, the physical. When they come in and they see something like this, they are overwhelmed, the vast majority of them. I, I think the very fact that their world is so ephemeral, ephemeral, now it's on your screen, now you see it, now you don't. And then when you say, this has been around for a thousand years and is still legible, it's tactile, uh, they'll get down and try to smell it. Some of them claim they've got obviously better olfactory senses than I do. They can get right down into the gutter and say, oh, I can still smell the ink. Uh, I'm not sure if that's true or not, but they like to think that they can. Um, I, th I think it's, it's the sensual experience of being with a book, something that has survived, something that other people have touched. I mean, you just have to look at this and you see where it's darkened in the right-hand corner, that where thumbs over the century have, 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 uh, have touched it. That has an effect on them and their ephemeral world. And it does give them a greater sense of permanence and also of the craftsmanship that goes into making something like this. Um, so it is, it is really a very overwhelming thing to see them work with uh, medieval manuscripts. And I'm so glad that we are building the collection um, for, for future reference for students. I have a feeling one of the things you are going to miss most about this job, actually, is that um, is, is the teaching experience and working with students and showing this material. Absolutely. It was that, rea that reaction made it, it was almost never did you show something and, and, and elicit a zero reaction. It was right. almost always 
this sense of awe and wonder. And they didn't want to leave often at the end of the session. They'd want to stay and look at it. You have to say, I'm sorry, the next group's coming in. You got to go. <laughs> so, I mean, and the other thing I think you may miss about the job is one of the favorite parts of our job is acquiring material. Absolutely. Um, and why don't we show, I think you have a, something that you, you purchased when you became um, head of the department. Yeah, it was right around the time I can, I remember very clear, I remember very, very clearly when this offer came. Um, so um, I, I was on vacation in Pisa in Italy, right. honestly, and um, staying in an awful hotel, truly awful hotel. And I remember sitting in this small cramped little room on the side of my bed and happily they did have internet and there was an email there from uh, a dealer in London that uh, we had worked with before, wonderful, wonderful uh, vendor. And he said, um, I have, I don't know if you'd be interested, but I have a Caxton that uh, you, you might want to acquire for the library. And uh, he, he sent the description and sent some pictures and I immediately sent them to uh, uh, my boss, Laurel and Larry, uh, the chief librarian. And I said, um, we do not have a Caxton. And maybe maybe, of, maybe for the, describe about you who William Caxton is. Sure. So William Caxton is what we, they, they call him the Gutenberg of the English language. He's the first person who printed in English. And uh, so it, it was a, it was a glaring, uh, you know, emptiness in our in our holdings that we had all these wonderful early English books, but we did not have any incunables, meaning a book printed before 1500 in English. And so when this came up, this was printed in 1481, and uh, it was printed in Westminster. And uh, so I thought, you know, this is the last copy of this book that is still in private hands. If we're serious about filling that gap, then we're probably going to have to act on this. Mm -hmm. And uh, happily, um, both Larry and Laurel uh, were of the opinion that, yes, we should look at this seriously. And that began a fairly long period, I think it was about 18 months, um, that we uh, raised funds, that we uh, uh, contacted donors, we contacted uh, in, uh, endowment agencies, and uh, together they were able to help us secure this incredibly wonderful, beautifully printed book uh, by William Caxton. Um, it, it's two books, actually, uh, um, on old age and on friendship. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, of course, been popular ever since. Um, it, it is the oldest English language book, printed English language book in Canada now. It, as I say, it was printed in Westminster in, in England. Um, and it, it's, it's a remarkable study to me on that transitional period in book production where we are still in 1481 in England. This is still the Middle Ages, and yet we have a printed book. And it reminds all of us that the invention of the printing press was not revolutionary in every way. I mean, you look at this print and some people think it's a manuscript because mm -hmm. of the way that the, the, the type looks, but of course they're basing their type on the way people wrote. Um, so there are any number of levels of uh, instructional value to this, this wonderful book. So it's certainly one of the ones that I was happiest that we were able to add to the collections. And uh, I'm, I'm sure it will continue to be, uh, especially once we can finally get students back into the library, um, I'm sure it'll be among the first ones that uh, that people will start to examine again. And we've since bought a, uh, a sort of a sister to this. this is we the, have. We now have the oldest French language uh, uh, text in the country, also printed by Caxton, uh, 1474, that time printed in Bruges when he was still living over on the continent. So uh, yes, we are, we are very lucky to have uh, two of the uh, two Caxtons, uh, which is pretty good given, you know, four years ago, we didn't have any, uh, we had a leaf um, of Caxton, but uh, now we, we have two complete, well, this is a complete volume, the French one isn't, isn't complete, but it's pretty darn close to it. It's very gratifying too, when we, when we're, I mean, these are, these are not inexpensive items, but it's very gratifying to know that, um, you know, un unlike buying, say, a, a database, for example, these things are you know, they're, 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 it's material. They're going to be here for hopefully for many, many years past, uh, past our retirements. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and I mean, it's, it's, it also reminds me of how lucky we have been in terms of the administration of the library that supports us in the building of collections and in the 
uh, in the friends of the fisher that we have who have had look at what we are doing and say it's valuable and continue to help us to acquire these uh, remarkable, remarkable books. So we're very, very lucky on both fronts. So what, what else do you have to, uh, I think we have a couple more items. Well, I think there are two last things that I'd like to show you, two yeah. of my, my favorite, favorite things. Thing. Um, one of them is this really, uh, you would think, well, this is not a particularly interesting book uh, to, to have it among my favorites. Um, and even the title would suggest that, as you can see the title of this, I'll see if I can zoom in. Uh, the title of this is Rejected Addresses, which doesn't <laughs> sound like it's gonna be a, a very interesting book, but what it is, it, just the background of it, uh, this, this is a, a later edition, but uh, in 1812, after the uh, Drury Lane Theater, which I'm sure many of our uh, uh, listeners know about, um, was rebuilt after a fire. And so it was decided that there was going to be a competition to see who would um, create a prose work that they would be able to deliver, or poetry, that they would be able to deliver at the actual opening of the, uh, of the, uh, um, of the theater again. And uh, after all that competition, none of the submissions were found acceptable and they just went to Lord Byron, you know, and got him to do it. Um, so this is, this is actually a spoof, this book is. And it contains all of these various and sundry um, uh, re addresses that supposedly were submitted and were rejected. But in fact, these are uh, this. This is a, a, a collection of satirical uh, essays, and uh, they're they're actually they're actually quite funny. Um, but the reason I, I I include it besides that story, which is you know kind of interesting, is because it, this reminds us also that the book. One of the things I learned here that the book is. Um, often treated as art in and of itself. And so if you look at this, you have the, what is called the foredge. But if I fan this foredge out, you will see that you are looking at a foredge painting. And in this case, uh, it's the, it's St. Paul's Cathedral. But if I turn the book around, this surely, clearly people had way too much time on their hands that they, they, they actually did two of these. Um, if you, fan it in the opposite direction, you are now looking at the Drury Lane Theater, the very wow. theater that is, of course, the subject of, of the rejected addresses. So as I say, it's just, it's, it, it, I've always found this fascinating that uh, um, the way people have treated their books, whether it's the binding, um, whether it's the, as you can see, the paste downs here, the marble paper, the forage painting, the way in which books have such an intimate connection with people's lives that they want to make them personal. They, they, they do personalize them in, in these ways. Um, so that's, that, that is also one of the reasons I say among, this is ranked among my favorite things. You could tell it's being handled quite a bit too, just by the condition. Oh, it has, yeah, the forage is, <laughs> and, and the very last one I wanna show you, it, it's, it's, it, it's such a recent acquisition um, and I think I showed it actually during the, uh, our, Christmas, uh, our Christmas broadcast. Um, this is an album I'm gonna scan out. Yep. That's not too out. Um, this is an album of watercolors and, and sketches that were done between the years 1854 and 1856 by a, a, a couple of visitors to Canada, um, the Grahams, Mr. and Mrs. Graham. They had come to visit relatives of theirs who uh, were living in uh, Guelph. And while they were here, they made this uh, incredible tour of Southern Ontario. Um, but about 70 of the pictures that they, that they drew or, or painted um, are Toronto scenes. So for example, the old, old courthouse that you have on, on Adelaide Street, um, tr the old Trinity College uh, down on Queen Street. Um, here you have Toronto mm -hmm. Harbor, frozen. Um, it, it, it's just an amazing uh, um, preservation of the images of Toronto and Southern Ontario just before the first photographs of the city are taken, which is in 1856. Um, so it, it's this amazing um, and, and, and really lively depiction of Toronto. Now, it's not without its problems. Um, mm -hmm. If you look here, for example, you have uh, a breakfast in a hotel. Everyone is sitting at the hotel is white. Everyone who is serving them are, are black men. And they're in many ways caricatures of black men. So it, it, it is also a reminder to us that, um, you know, the prejudices of the past are preserved in the, in the books that have been created. 
Um, but I think that even that in and of itself is an important thing for those who are doing social studies of uh, Ontario, of Canada, uh, in, that, uh, in that period pre-Confederation. Um, so it, it's, I, I just find it a remarkable, some of them are caricatures, they're great, some great caricatures. And uh, as, as, as a proud Canadian, um, these, are, these are images that I was so glad we were able to, to uh, uh, repatriate from, uh, from an English owners and uh, bring them back here to, to Canada. So that's, that's the last one of, of the stuff that I thought I would show. Well, I think it's, it's great too, the range you happen to show us here because you've gone from, you know, you've gone from the 11th century all the way up to the 19th century. And you probably have items you could have shown that have been from the 20 and 21st century in terms of some of your favorite items as well. Absolutely, um, absolutely I could have. If, uh, as, 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 I've, as you very well know, we have amazing collections of artist books by, by uh, Shanty Bay Press. They were in contact with me actually this week. They want to oh, come down good. and drop off more archive. Yeah, so um, we can, yeah, the, the, that's one of the things that people have to, uh, remember is that special collections um, doesn't mean necessarily old. Mm -hmm. it, it means that these are, are um, uh, items that are uh, perhaps created in limited numbers, uh, perhaps are created with a view to their artistry, um, perhaps are uh, small press runs of, of Canadian authors, Canadian uh, printing houses. There are all sorts of uh, factors that, that help inform us to do the selecting um, about what should be here. And it isn't just that they are old. Uh, it's, it's so much more in terms of helping people interpret the times in which we are living today. We have, that's our job now to make sure that there's material here from the 21st century that 100 years from now people will look at and say, isn't that amazing? You know, all the, I mean, I've been here now through several retirements of, uh, of the librarians and um, I think everyone has sort of left a legacy in their own way. Do you, can you point to anything in particular you think that maybe that that you're leaving us um, from a material point of view? Um, well, I, I think I, I know one of the things that I was most interested in from the time I came here was the building up the medieval manuscripts. Um, uh, and and um, again, thanks to the support of uh, uh, previous librarians here and Donderman, uh, uh, Deborah Whiteman um, and and the faculty and, and and the administration next door, plus also the interest of our faculty mm -hmm. here on campus. Um, annually, I'd say for the last 15, 16, 17 years, we have added one, if not two, and recently three and four medieval manuscripts to the collections. Um, given our our role in in terms of being uh, support to the the. Uh, faculty here on campus. Um, I'm, I, I'm very proud of the legacy that, that says we are serving the Center for Medieval Studies, Pontifical Institute, cooperating with them uh, in terms of obtaining these extremely uh, rare materials, unique, of course, because they are manuscripts, that are helping us understand the Middle Ages. So that is certainly one of the areas that I'm very proud of that I can say. And it's been passed on to a wonderful librarian, Tim Perry, who is, who is uh, uh, you know, uh, a much better scholar of these things than I am. So I, I'm really, really proud of the fact that he's taking uh, uh, control of it. So yeah, I, the medieval manuscripts for sure is one of the things that I'm, I'm most proud of that, um, that we, are, we have grown over the last 20 years that I've been here. Do you think, do you know how many books you've probably cataloged here? <laughs> oh my, I, I would think over the last 20 years, it's got to be, it's it, it obviously in the, uh, I would think it's in the 10, 10,000s, you know, into the 20,000s. Um, as I got better, I got faster. <laughs> so uh, it didn't, it didn't end up staying at two books a day. Um, so yeah, it's got to be, it's got to be in that territory. Um, and, anyway, and, and fascinating. Yeah, anyway, PJ, this has been great. Um, from a personal point of view, I just want to say that um, you've been a fantastic colleague of mine over the years. I've learned so much from you. Um, your your humility and 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 good humor as well will definitely be missed in uh, in at at the Fisher Library, um, and I just we hope you're not going to be a complete stranger to us here at Fisher. <laughs> I promise I will be back. Uh, I, I'm particularly looking forward to these staff parties which we've missed. <laughs> right. So anyway, PJ, thank you very much. Um, 
it's, it's, it's been a real honor to work with you over these years. And as I said, from a personal point of view, I'm, I'm really, I'm really going to miss, uh, miss, miss having you as, as, as a close colleague. Well, so. thank you, Johnny. You always make this easy too. So much appreciated. I'm going to miss all the staff and the friends and the administration too. Thank you. <laughs> So this was a great start, I think, to our second season of uh, Between the Pillars. Um, we're going to be back in two weeks' time um, with uh, Lior Bromberg, who um, I won't I won't say what she's going to be talking about, but it's going to be a lot of uh, it's, it's going to be a very fun uh, fun episode as well. So please join us in two weeks' time again. Tell all your friends about us. Uh, you can watch all the past episodes of uh, Between the Pillars on our YouTube channel, and we hope to see you in two weeks' time. Thank you. Thank you again, PJ. Thank you.